ultimately, the effectiveness of your communication is directly tied to your organization's growth. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. Today, a teaching episode, no guest, just me, and a little bit shorter. And as usual, I hope it helps you thrive in life and leadership. And in this episode, I want to help you improve your communication skills. And I want to introduce you to the Sermon Impact Matrix. Now, that's going to help you assess where your preaching lands and how to make it better over time. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm a business leader. I'm a CEO. I'm a junior in a company. I'm an intern and I don't preach. So this doesn't apply to me, right? Well, let me challenge you on that. If you're a leader, great communication is a key to great leadership. Think about this. The clearer you are, the better your ideas, the better your leadership. Now that's true if you're contributing to a meeting, if you're just like chatting in a meeting, or if you're presenting a slide deck, or if you're doing any kind of private or public communication. As a rule, the better you communicate, the better a leader you become. Now, this episode is a little bit visual, particularly toward the end, and you may wanna get the show notes for it. So all you can do to do that is click the link in the description of your podcast player or go to kerryneuhoff.com slash episode 664. You'll see the visual for the Sermon Impact Matrix. Uh, in the show notes. Now, one quick note to kick things off today before we get started. Every month, I do a live Zoom call with leaders inside my Art of Leadership Academy, and I'd love for you to join me. Now, what we do, we do a live Q&A. Usually, I do a little bit of teaching, and then it's an Ask Me Anything. And in just a few weeks, it's not going to be just me. Patrick Lencioni, yes, you heard that right, Pat Lencioni, is hosting a coaching call for us. I'll be there. Pat will be there live. And on the call, Pat is going to coach you through a new model to help you better understand the types of work that bring you more energy and fulfillment, avoid the stuff that drains you, and to become more self-aware as a leader. So don't pass on the opportunity to get direct live coaching from Patrick Lencioni and ask your questions live to make sure that you don't miss it. Click the link in the description of this episode wherever you're watching or listening or visit theartofleadershipacademy.com. Again, that's theartofleadershipacademy.com. And then recently, I sat down with Scott Evans. He's the CEO of Outreach. And we discussed the Back to Church Sunday movement that is happening across the United States. Here's what Scott had to share. Back to Church Sunday is the third Sunday of September each year. This year, it's going to be on September 15th. And it is a movement of 60,000 churches from 120 denominations coming together to invite their communities to church. Now, as a pastor, you might be asking, does Back to Church Sunday work? On average, we have seen in surveys that churches grow by 25% on Back to Church Sunday. 90% of the churches say that it helps their church be more outwardly focused. And 97% say they would do it again. So how can your church get involved? Well, it's free, and any size church can do it and customize it to their church. So you can sign up for free and get on the national map and get the free planning guide. To get your church involved, visit backtochurch.com. So now let's dig into communication on the podcast. Specifically, we're going to do it through the lens of preaching, but I think you will see the application across the board. So here's what's true. The number one factor people look for in a church is guess what? It's the quality of the preaching. 68% of people choose a church based on the quality of the preaching, the quality of the communication. Now, I also believe that that is true of your leadership. If you have excellent communication skills, you're more likely to get a job. You're more likely to get promoted. You have the ability to communicate your ideas in a clear and compelling way that can persuade people to follow you. So not a stat directly related to business, but if you think about it, if 86% of people are picking a church on the basis of communication, you know, as your communication skills grow, you grow as a leader. Now, here's the challenge for all of us who communicate, and that is every leader. Often in our head, the talk that we prepared works, right? You get up there and you think, okay, I've got this thing nailed, but in real life, it falls flat. Think about it. I mean, you've been sitting there as a listener as an audience member, bored by a talk, bored out of your mind that I'm sure the speaker thought was helpful, or maybe you've been by confused by a talk that perhaps the communicator thought was clear, or you found your attention wandering during a talk that the communicator thought was brilliant and coherent, right? Communicator thinks it's great, 
Audience says, not so much. In the end, and here's what you know, it really doesn't matter what the communicator thinks, right? Because talks aren't judged by the person giving the talk. They're ultimately judged by the listener. Think about it. This podcast will not be evaluated by how awesome I thought it was or how hard I prepared. Its value will be determined by whether you, the listener, the viewer, found it helpful and engaging. And if you find a message or podcast helpful and engaging, what are you going to do? Well, you might text the link to a friend or share it with your staff. And if you don't find it helpful, you're not going to do that. (laughs) You might not even listen any further than this. Ultimately, the effectiveness of your communication is directly tied to your organization's growth. That's a really important principle. So that brings us to this question. What actually works? Well, at the heart of great communication and great preaching are two basic factors I want to focus on. Number one, the quality of the idea. Number two, the quality of of the delivery. So let's break that down and let's talk first about the quality of the idea. What do I mean by the quality of the idea? Well, every compelling talk should have a governing idea. If you speak for 30 to 40 minutes, that's a lot of words, but if you're going to be an effective communicator, there has to be one strong governing idea under the whole talk. Not a weak idea, not a vague idea, not five ideas, not 17 rambly points one strong governing idea. In this talk, in this podcast, I want to make you a better communicator. I'm going to show you how. So what makes for a quality idea? Well, if you're preaching, it has to be anchored in scripture and the truth of God's word. I mean, that's where it starts, right? And this is what a lot of preachers miss. It also has to be relevant to your audience's life. Sometimes you've heard messages that are relevant to life, but not very grounded in scripture. And sometimes you've heard some beautiful scriptural exegesis, but you have no idea what to do with it. So if you're giving a talk rather than a sermon, the content still has to be meaningful and relevant. It's got to be anchored to truth of some kind, otherwise it's not going to resonate. And it's got to be relevant to your listener's life, right? Why are you still listening? Because you want to improve your communication skills. That's true. Excellent content resonates. Think about this. In the same way a crystal glass will resonate when the right frequency is played, the human heart responds when it hears a great idea. It simply resonates. So one of the best ways to know whether you have a strong, clear, governing idea is to answer this question, what is your talk about? And you've got to be able to answer it with a simple phrase. It's probably not clear enough if all you have is a topic like, oh, I'm going to preach on prayer, or I'm talking about the pace of life these days. There's a million things in that area. Similarly, if your answer is, I want to show the difference between people who pray and people who don't, and also people who barely pray and people who think prayer doesn't work, and an overview of Old Testament and New Testament prayer practices, mm mm-mm. No, too vague, too broad, too convoluted. That's not specific enough. The clearer the idea, the more memorable and effective the idea becomes. So that is the hard work. It takes a lot of time to come up with clarity. So second thing is you should be able to express that idea in a compelling way. And that leads us to the second factor, great delivery. So you got to have a great idea, but you also have to have great delivery. So while it's great to research a talk in depth, a bad delivery can kill it. It can can kill it overnight. You might have done hours, days, decades of research, bad delivery, dead. Let me tell you a story. I was valedictorian at my university graduation, and the speaker who preceded me at the convocation, it was a scorching summer day. He was not a hit, okay? So it is hot, hot, humid. We're in the bright sun. He talks in a monologue about, I can still remember the subject, but nothing he said about it, interdisciplinary learning. Most of the audience had no idea what he was talking about, but I like, I got to follow this guy. I'm going to listen. Talked about interdisciplinary learning for 45 minutes with phrasing so complicated, nobody could understand him. And these were university graduates. Okay. He was receiving an honorary doctorate for his work and he was the best researched person who spoke that day, but he was mind bogglingly boring. The only thing everybody was thankful for was that it was over. And what I was thankful for was I was up next and I was almost guaranteed I couldn't do worse. That's how bad the talk was. 
All right. It was a terrible delivery, a convoluted idea. I'm sure he was brilliant, but what do you need to be a great communicator? Great idea, great delivery. That's where a message really becomes powerful. So what goes into a great delivery? First, knowing and understanding your message is really important. A lot of preachers will either read their talks from notes, they're kind of down here just, you know, paying attention and you, you end up with a reedy voice and it sounds like you're reading. So that happens or they think they have to memorize their talk. Now, the best preaching advice I ever got was when I was in seminary. There was a preacher who just mesmerized me, talked for 45 minutes without using notes and I got to drive him back to the airport. And I said, how did you do that? I want to learn how you memorized your talk and delivered it so well. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget this. He said, don't memorize your talk. Understand it. I don't memorize my talk. I just understand it. I know where I'm going. And you know what? That is such great advice. Memorization can make a talk stiff, or if you lose your place, you're struggling to get back. My wife and I recently did a seminar for some young leaders in Montana, and we led a couple of sessions together, and we had internalized our material. There were no notes. And I heard so often from the young leaders in the room, how did you give talks like that? And it was pretty casual, but they're like, you guys didn't use notes. Well, my wife prepares really well, and I had so internalized the content, I didn't need the notes. If you understand your talk, your mind will easily fill in the blanks. So if you get a little bit stuck, you're just going to fill it in with something else or you're going to cut to the next section and nobody ever complained about a shorter talk. Further, because you have a simple idea, a strong governing idea, you're not trying to memorize 17 unrelated points, right? Here's the basis of my talk. Two more things that can really help with great delivery, starting your message early and eye contact. All right. Notice if you're watching on YouTube, what am I doing? I'm looking at you. I'm not looking at my notes. So how do you do that? Well, it actually starts with advanced message preparation. If you start working on a talk a few weeks before giving it, something happens in your brain. The talk lodges in your long-term memory, not your short-term memory. That makes learning it far more effortless. Think of it this way. like Great preaching is like a stew. The longer you let it simmer, the better it gets. So start your message prep early, as in weeks, or sometimes if you have the bandwidth, months early if you're working on a really big series because it will lodge in a different part of your brain. Now, on the other hand, if on Thursday morning, prior to a Sunday, you're still trying to decide what you're going to say on Sunday morning, your preaching might be true, but it probably isn't going to be clear. Clarity takes time. And what that means is you're sorting through a 100 ideas to find a good idea and eliminating all the rest until you have the clearest, best idea left standing, and then you go and preach that. Again, you're not going to get that if you start on a Thursday or a Saturday. And then practicing the message solo, and even with a few people, is a great test run, a way to get feedback to improve. If you've done it weeks in advance, you can run it by a small panel of trusted voices a week ahead of time, and that way you can get the message to have the greatest impact possible when you deliver it because you already know it doesn't work. You will get the feedback in advance, you'll make it better, and you will know what is going to land and what isn't going to land before you deliver it. Now, another factor before we get into more details is eye contact. Your congregation or audience simply believes you more when you look at them than when you're reading off of your notes in that stilted voice. It's just a basic human dynamic. And eye contact only really happens when you've worked far enough ahead to understand and internalize your message so you're not just reading off your notes. Now, there's a lot more to dynamic delivery. I have a whole course on that called The Art of Preaching. But for now, let's finish by looking at what happens when you combine the different possible scenarios of an idea and a delivery. Okay, so powerful talks have a great idea and a great delivery. So this is the Sermon Impact Matrix. I want you to imagine a two-by-two two matrix with four boxes. So basically an XY axis and then a square with four boxes in it. And I want to break that down for you. The combination of the two gives you four possible outcomes for your talk. In the bottom left box of the matrix is a talk with a bad idea and a bad delivery. Do that and you get an irrelevant talk. It's not memorable. It's not profound. That kind of talk over time can create a dying church, okay? So bad idea, bad delivery, irrelevant talk, 
dying church. Then move over a square to the bottom right square and imagine a talk that's a combination of a great idea, but a bad delivery. That produces what I call an academic talk. It may be profound or it might be profoundly true or theologically accurate, but the delivery made it not memorable. You made it boring because it's boring, confused, or unclear. And over time, academic talk, so that's a great idea and bad delivery, produces a stagnant church because the messages also aren't compelling. Now let's move up to the top. And the top left square is a talk consisting of a bad idea, but a great delivery. Okay, bad idea, great delivery. What does that produce? It produces a trivial talk. It's not profound because it's a bad idea, but it's memorable because it's a great delivery and maybe the guy's charismatic and the idea was clearly expressed. And you know what that produces? Bad idea, great delivery, a shallow church, trivial talks, all style, no substance. You might even call it heresy, okay? Trivial talks over time produce a shallow church. That's where you have a bad idea, but a great delivery. Now, in the top right, let's go to the box that we kind of all want, the one that's left over. And that is a combination of a great idea and a great delivery. And you know what that produces? That produces a powerful talk. The talk is both memorable and profound. It's true, and it's a brilliant delivery. And delivering talks like that over time can produce a growing church. In fact, if you look at most growing churches, that's the preaching combination. Great content, great delivery. So in those four boxes, you've got the sermon impact matrix. And the various combinations of idea and delivery produces irrelevant talks, academic talks, trivial talks, and also powerful talks. Now, before we wrap up, I want to go a little further into each quadrant one by one. So let's go back to the bottom left. Irrelevant talks, that characterizes dying churches. Bad idea, bad delivery. It's not actually true, and it's not actually clear. So an irrelevant message is a combination of bad ideas and bad deliveries. In essence, you just haven't done your homework. The ideas don't tap into the truth of Scripture, the relevancy of people's lives, and the delivery it's just not that good. You're reading, you're confusing, you're you're distracted, you're just not compelling. And if your message ends up being neither true to God's word nor clearly understandable, I don't know what else to call it except irrelevant. And this is the fastest path to creating a dying church. Deliver bad ideas in a less than compelling way. So what do you do if you find yourself there? What do you do if you say, you know what? Yeah, I'm not very clear. It's not very tied to scripture and the delivery isn't that great. Well, what you want to do is you don't want to leave prep to the last minute. The easiest way to create irrelevant messages is to leave prep to the last minute because you're going to be confusing and your delivery won't be great for reasons we've already discussed. Your thoughts are simply not going to congeal into a coherent whole and a single point, and you probably cheated your study time too. So what's the solution? If you find yourself in this quadrant delivering irrelevant messages, do the hard work of becoming clearer and anchoring your message in the truth. Take time to learn your message well enough and then deliver it in a more engaging way. So you really want to back up the clock and you want to get started early. Do your hard work studying, maybe clarify it in front of a group of people. Uh, Work on your delivery. Don't just work on your talk, work on your preaching and become a better communicator. There's so many free resources out there. I've got a bunch. There's so many TED Talks. I've got a whole course on it. We can help you. There's good news. You can get out of that because nobody wants to stay there. Okay, let's move over a quadrant and talk about the bottom right. Academic messages. And this is characteristic of a lot of stagnant churches. True message, like good exegesis, just not clear or compelling. So when your sermon may be biblically faithful, and actually true, or your message, if you're just communicating generally, you've got great stats and all that, but it's just not clear and compelling. This often manifests as a good idea, poorly expressed. The message is accurate, but it's just not clear, let alone profound. And academic messages tend to produce stagnant congregations. You just don't grow. So confusing or losing people is expensive because here's what happens. During the talk, 
they have to do the hard work of not just listening to what you say, but clarifying it, trying to follow you, trying to figure out what to do with it. And most people will just give up and they won't bother trying to follow or to understand you. Now, some members and attendees might sign up for this week after week. Sometimes it might even pass for what they call deep teaching. My working definition of deep teaching is it was so confusing, no one could understand it. It must be deep right? Okay. But you don't want to live there because you're unlikely to reach more people or see your church grow when you're consistently unclear. Worse, you can even develop a self-righteous streak and start blaming people who don't, quote, get it. You start to blame the audience, blame the congregation. You don't take any responsibility. So when communication is unclear, it's never the audience's fault. It's always the communicator's fault. If this has not been a clear podcast, I don't blame you. I blame me. So if you're there, you got great exegesis, great biblical truth, but you just can't deliver it, what do you do? Well, first of all, keep being faithful. I mean, I'm really glad that you love and appreciate the scripture, but work harder on making your delivery and key points clear and memorable. And again, it helps to start your message prep early because clarity and working on your craft takes time. So now let's move up a quadrant to the top left and look at trivial messages which produce shallow churches. And that's a combination of a bad idea with a great delivery. In other words, the message isn't true, but it is clear. Now, pastors, this one's easy to fall into because there's so much online pressure to be clear and you want to go viral. So, you know, you're working on memorable phrases and bottom lines that ring and things that rhyme and stuff that's really going to connect. But sometimes you can neglect to check if your message is actually rooted in truth. So, You might be, in this category, an excellent orator, but you fail to do the hard work that great teaching actually requires in the end. Now, this category breaks my heart, and it appears to be on the rise. Not just false teaching, I mean, that's always been around, but people who are just so bent on being clear that they've lost the truth. Obviously, at its worst, This is how cults spread, right? Leaders preach clear messages that are not remotely grounded in truth or actually grounded in falsehood. But there's a much more subtle form of this at work in legitimate Christian churches where sincere pastors have realized that the internet is changing the communication game. And I want to give you a couple of examples to consider. So if you scroll Instagram or TikTok, what you'll probably see is more than a few messages that are clear, but not actually true. And I mean, the internet is just a float with that stuff. So I want to pick a few of the verbal memes that maybe you've seen on the internet as examples. These aren't preaching memes per se, but I have heard preachers say them before. And it's actually a really bad example. So take this one. You will never be criticized by someone who is doing more than you. You will only be criticized by someone doing less. You ever hear that one? You'll never be criticized by someone doing more than you. You're only going to get criticized by someone doing less. So let's unpack that. Well, it sounds compelling. It's also completely false. Some of the best criticism I have ever received is from people who are doing more than me. I've had amazing communicators critique my communication. I've had some invaluable feedback as a leader, from people who are far better leaders than me, accomplishing far more than me. Now, they're always gentle and kind when they do it, but man, has it been helpful. And I hope that's true of you too. I hope that some of the best stuff you ever hear is from people who are doing more than you. So why do we say this? Why does that feel so compelling? Well, it's memorable, but I think deep down it makes us feel superior to the trolls and the people who maybe are taking cheap shots at us. But it's actually not true nor is it grounded in scripture. You can get criticized by people who are doing more than you, and it might be the most helpful stuff you've ever received in your life. So here's another one. You've heard this preached, God helps those who help themselves. Well, that's just not biblical. It's a nice self-help meme. It's floating in all kinds of circles, but it ignores the complexity of human nature, sin, and redemption. And well, Aren't you supposed to love your enemies, bless those who persecute you? Aren't you supposed to um, help those who can't help themselves? Aren't you supposed to do all of that as a result of our faith? So it's just not true. Memorable, clear, not true. Now, when you look at this and you're in that quadrant on a regular basis, here's what's true. Shallow preachers produce shallow followers. When we look at the discipleship crisis we seem to be in as a culture, 
Maybe that's a reason why. So what's the solution? Well, here, your delivery's fine. Just do the hard work of wrestling through the text and finding the actual truth before you work on how to make the truth clear and understood. And then finally, let's spend some time in the quadrant we all want to be in. And on good days, we get in, right? Powerful messages. They are characteristic of growing churches. They are clear and true. It's a great idea, a great delivery, and they are memorable and profound. So this is where you want to land. And delivering sermons that are both clear and true doesn't guarantee your church will grow, but it does position you to grow. Preachers who produce powerful messages that usher in life change have done the hard work of doing the studying, wrestling with the text, and also spending probably just as much time wrestling through how to make the idea clear and relevant to their listeners' lives. Now, this is the sweet spot, right? This is where all of us want to be. And growing churches land there pretty much every weekend, or at least more weekends than not. So delivering both true and clear sermons is a place where you can position yourself to grow. In other words, what you're doing is you're removing the obstacles that could be in your way as a communicator to communicate clearly and powerfully with the world that you're trying to reach. Preachers who produce powerful messages as a rule have done the hard work of studying, wrestling with the text, and also working so hard on their delivery. They're always getting better. They're delivering the message in advance. They're asking for feedback. And that is what you need to do. Now, if you want to hack, here's a hack for you. One of the best things you can do is ask a better communicator to critique your message. All right, you want to do that. I've gone to some of the best communicators I know, and I've asked them, can you give me honest, even hurtful feedback on what I've done? And they'll tell me, and I'll tell you, sometimes it's like, oh, got to lick my wounds. I thought it was better than it was, but that's how you can grow. And that means you got to be working on your craft, not in your craft. It also means you have to work far enough ahead, and the pros always do that, that you have internalized your message enough to really make eye contact and give what really feels like and is a natural delivery to your message. And if you do this, if you do that hard work, a compelling, powerful idea and a great delivery, then you are on the road to delivering powerful messages that are grounded in truth and are very clear. And that can help lead you and your church into growth. So we have covered a lot and I get it. You might be saying, this is great, Carrie, but do you have any idea how busy I am? I don't have time to research my sermons thoroughly or to work through the time it takes to make my ideas clear and comprehensible, let alone work on my delivery. So I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to dig deep. How could you build in more time? So here's how I started. I want to give you a couple of quick hacks. Chances are you're not preaching 52 Sundays a year. There's 52 weeks in a year. You're not preaching all of them. I hope you're not. If not, that's step one. Don't preach all of them, okay? But most of you aren't. So the next time you have a week off, don't take a week off from writing. Write a message anyway. Then you're one week ahead. If you do that for the course of a year, it's not that hard to be two to four weeks ahead at the end of a year. You might even be six to eight weeks ahead. Another option, you're like, okay, I don't really know whether I can do that. I got to preach a lot and I'm so busy. Well, bring in a guest preacher a few times a year or maybe use a video message. They're around and they're free. Uh, a third option, put extra commitments on hold for a few weeks and then hustle to get ahead on your sermon. Just take no extra meetings, outside meetings, and that way you've got some time to prep in advance and let your messages marinate. Now, I know how hard this is, and I pushed back too. When I was working week to week, I'm like, I got a million reasons why I can't work ahead, but you got to know you can do it. I did it. You can do it. And you're going to do one of the most important things you can do, invest in your communication skills. So let's recap. Here's what the four different approaches to preaching produce. Combining a bad idea and a bad delivery gets you an irrelevant talk and a dying church. The combination of a great idea and a bad delivery produces an academic talk, which leads to a stagnant church. A bad idea and a great delivery means you end up with a trivial talk, which leads you to a shallow church. And finally, what we're all shooting for, the combination of a great idea and a great message can lead to a growing church. So all of this is in the Sermon Impact Matrix. I'd love to get that into your hands. Uh, have a look at the show notes, and I hope this teaching has been helpful. I'd love your feedback on social. I'm Carrie Newhoff on most channels, or shoot us a note at carrie at carrienewhoff.com. Now, 
If you want more help in becoming a clear and compelling preacher or communicator, a great step forward is one click away. What would it look like for you to truly transform your sermon prep, your delivery, and the impact that your message has on Sunday morning? What if you were confident before you got into the pulpit that the message was going to connect? That's the exact reason that Mark Clark and I created The Art of Preaching, to equip you with everything you need to be an effective preacher and communicator. Whether you want to ditch your notes for good, I show you how to do that, how to find meaningful pieces of scripture to preach about, because, you know, there's a lot of text, how to craft bottom lines that people will remember and apply to their lives and how to prep sermons week after week without hitting writer's block or burning out, The Art of Preaching has strategies and insights for you to preach engaging, life-changing sermons. The material has been used and trusted by over 3,000 pastors from churches of all different sizes and denominations, and it's proven to work. You can learn more by clicking the link of the description in this episode or by visiting theartofpreachingcourse.com. That's theartofpreachingcourse.com. Just click the link in the description of this episode wherever you're tuning in. One last note, join me and Patrick Lencioni in the Art of Leadership Academy, August 8th, 100% included in your membership. You can go to theartofleadershipacademy.com and check out what's happening at Outreach and Back to Church Sunday. There's a movement going on. You can get your church involved today at backtochurch.com. Coming up on the podcast, we've got Mark Sayers, Charles Duhigg, N.T. Wright, Lisa Turkhurst, Sharon McMahon, Chuck DeGroat, and a whole lot more coming up. And I hope this episode has helped you identify and break a growth barrier you're facing. Catch you next time on the podcast.